Good morning Interweb, this is follow up to the main video, Game of Tones. If you haven't already seen that video, go check it out, otherwise none of this is going to make any sense whatsoever. Did I miss something or is there a specific reason you always devoiced? Does making a voiceless consonant voiced not make the tone low? So to your first point, we don't always devoice. It's a good idea to devoice obstruents, so that's plosives, fricatives or affricates, but to voice sonorants or resonance. So that's nasals, semivowels, or liquids. This is because obstruents prefer to be voiceless and sonorants or resonants prefer to be voiced. To your second point, does voicing a voiceless consonant give a low tone? Well, that all depends on when the voicing occurs. So let's say in the proto-lang you have a syllable pan. Let's say there's some sort of sound change that means that all word initial obstruents voice pan. Let's say tonogenesis occurs now, so the voiced obstruent lowers the pitch of the syllable, devoice to make it phonemic, and we're left with pan with a low tone. So making a voiceless consonant voiced prior to tonogenesis would produce a low tone. But let's switch up the order now. So protolang, pan. Let's say tonogenesis happens now. So the voiceless obstruent creates a high tone, pan. And then let's say a sound change kicks in that voices all word initial obstruents, pan. So in summation, the very basic idea is that to do tonogenesis, you make obstruents voiceless and you make sonorants or resonance voiced to make the tone phonemic. And if you have additional voicing changes, different results occur depending on whether or not they happen prior to tonogenesis or after tonogenesis. Does vowel quality affect tone at all? For instance, might a particular vowel be more likely to forbid low register tones? Whilst I'm sure this occurs in some languages somewhere, the vast majority of the time the process of tonogenesis affects the vowel, as opposed to the vowel affecting the process of tonogenesis. So how do resonance end up with tones then? Is it the same process but for syllabic resonance instead of vowels? Assuming your language allows tone to go on syllabic consonants, yeah, same process. Though there are languages that forbid tones to go on syllabic consonants. Do tonal languages evolve to lose their tones? If so, is the process just the reverse, where onset consonants are added to replace tonal distinctions? Again, I'm sure there's some language somewhere that does this, but the majority of the time we find that tonal exodus occurs via three pathways. The most common of which is the reinterpretation of tone as accent or stress. So for example, let's say we have these bunch of words here. The roots contain a whole variety of tones and the suffixes are low tones. You could look at this as simply being a case of a prominent first syllable and an unprominent second syllable. And you could reanalyze the whole thing, wipe out the tonal distinctions and just make it like a stress accent sort of thing. Another way IRL tonal exodus occurs is through contact with non-tonal languages. The speakers simply adopt the non-tonal tendencies of the other language. And then a third way is true like radical tone merger. So like say a language has a bunch of rising tones, they all just collapse to a single rising tone. The same deal with falling tones, maybe the levels also collapse, then maybe the simple contratones collapse to levels. Keep doing that and eventually you wipe out tone distinctions in the language. This will all kind of be covered more in part two of this video, but just that's a little short TLDR. Doesn't English's I am content and the content of the box count as this. No, so what English is doing here is stress. Stress is where one or more syllables are treated as being more prominent than the other syllables in a word, and that prominence is conveyed through loudness. Tone doesn't come into it at all, but you can take a language with stress and turn it into a tonal language. That's another way of doing tonal genesis. One I don't really understand, so I'll link you to DJP's video on tone. He goes over it in brief there. So if we would make a quote average human language, it would have tone. That's interesting. Yeah, to the lay person, tone seems like this weird exotic thing, but really us English speakers, we're the weird ones here. Also, there are those who speculate that tone might even be primitive to human languages, i.e. the first human languages would have contained tone. As far as I'm aware, that's largely conjecture, obviously. I think that the more popular opinion is that tone being quite a complex thing has to be evolved. But anyway, tone, it's really normal, it's really common. We shouldn't treat it as being unusual in any way. Would tonality interfere with singing? Perhaps it could be a sort of creative constraint. So I don't know cross-linguistically what the norm is for tonal languages when it comes to singing. I suspect it could go one of two ways. Either tone inflection is maintained while singing, or it's just completely ignored and context can do its job. If tone is maintained, you might even end up with a scenario where you get like little microtonal 
in variations on the absolute notes that are sung. So for those who can read sheet music, imagine Mary Had a Lamb, looks like this. Now imagine English is a tonal language where tonal distinctions are maintained when singing. You might end up with a situation that looks like this, where each of the notes have little inflections up or down to maintain the tone. Might beg for a really cool musical genre. If you, dear viewer, speak a tonal language, let me know how singing works. I'm very intrigued. Anyways, that was that Game of Tones follow-up done. Massive thanks to you for watching, and again, a massive thanks to all the patrons who helped make Artifacts in a possibility. In particular, Lycan, Johan Spadka, Oliver Reed, Spencer Brownlee, Alexander Roper, Andrew Pisha Hale, John Huyer, Rip the Passe, and World Anvil. Until next time, Edgar out.